So we're in Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 8 is where we left off. So Stephen's story. Chapter 6, verse 8. And, okay. and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them Cilicia and of Asia, 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 disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. They then summoned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders, and the scribes came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel." Then said the high priest, are, there thing, are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in, oh, Prince, that's a good name. What is that? Haran. Who? Oh, Haran. That is not what the King James has. So we're just going to say Haran. Uh, And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Quran. Okay, I see. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, not so much to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when he has yet had no child. And God spake on this, and God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage, and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will, I judge, said God, and after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him, and delivered him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a darth over the land of Egypt and Canaan in great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers. He sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred were made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, therefore, fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham brought bought for a sum of money, the sons of the more, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, when God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him from her own son, for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? 
But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, here appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and he drew near to it to behold it. The voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hands of the angel which appeared to him in the, in the bush. He brought them out after he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses, Moses which said unto the children of Israel, Prophet, shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness when the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and which our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness. Yea, he took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the altar of your god Rempan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had pointed speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build at me? saith the Lord. Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears? Ye always do resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on them with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and flopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin on their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. It's a long chapter. Okay, I probably mangled some of that because the language in this translation is really old-fashioned. That was hard to read. But I like it because there's just some differences between this and what we read all the time. Okay. So last week we wrapped up with the first seven deacons being picked, and now we have, they start speaking about Stephen. So Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So we've seen those phrases before. What do those mean? They were out, they were out witnessing to people in the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. And so Stephen... Specifically, so you had grace and power. 
So when someone is described as having grace and power, the Holy Spirit is with them. Yes. To absolutely to know what to speak to the people. Right. I say so. Full of grace and power and great wonders and signs. He's doing the apostolic work. He's not an apostle. But when he talks about signs and wonders, he's working miracles. Uh, would have to be similar. They don't say what the miracles were, but he is doing things similar to that which the apostles are doing. Um, and again, that was just something special that that first generation was able to do. And now we have this. So we know, okay, so Stephen's out there. He's doing, he's doing what a pastor does in those days. He's, he's doing, he's proclaiming Christ crucified and resurrected for the forgiveness of sins and to prove, to back up his words, he's able to do these great works. And now we have these guys who belong to the synagogue of the freedmen. So, does anybody know who they are? Because this should be the first time that anybody encounters this phrase in the Bible. Of Cyrene, Alexandria. Right. All right. So, now, but you have to watch the grammar because it does say "and of." So you have members of the synagogue of the freedmen, and of Cyrenians, and Alexandrias, and Cilicia in Asia. Oh, so Roman Jews who've been freed from slavery. Yes. So the synagogue of the freedmen is exactly what it sounds like. So these are freed men. These are former slaves, and this is their synagogue. Uh, why they have a synagogue of their own? Uh, don't really know. Uh, that's one of those culture things that we talked about way back when we were talking about the outline of Acts and the, the social uh, aspects of that time. So you have, remember you have this audience that Luke is writing to, which are going to be kind of bougie. They're going to be kind of your upper class, upper class citizens, because that's who's going to be able to distribute this book throughout the churches, because this is an expensive proposition. So he's got to explain these terms sometimes. So the synagogue of the freedmen, one thing, one note that I've seen about that is that the early Christians may have kind of glommed onto that that, okay, this is our synagogue. Because they didn't have churches, right? They had houses. Or they may have glommed onto the synagogue and go, okay, this is a place where we can meet. Because who else is going to be accepting of outsiders? People who used to be slaves. So socially, they would have been kind of similar groups. They would have had uh, some mutual support, maybe? Safety in numbers. Yeah, safety in numbers. So, so far... Christianity is not outlawed in the empire yet. It will be, but not yet. But among the Jews, among the ruling council of Jews, this Christianity thing has got to be put down. And we're starting to see that beginning right here. This is the beginning of the real persecution of the church. Uh, so you have these Jews now stand up, and they're going to argue with Stephen. And then they instigated the charges against him. Okay, so they're arguing with him about the things he's preaching, which he's preaching Christ crucified and resurrected. And they can't argue with him. He could, they can't argue his logic. We don't know what he said, but he probably used the same arguments you're going to see Peter use, that we've seen Paul use. He's going to be using the same words, the same sermon. They can't argue with him, so what do they do? Charges. Right, what did they do to Jesus? Remember, Acts is going to parallel Luke pretty much all the way through the book. On purpose, Luke did that deliberately because you don't always have to put things in chronological order, but he puts it in, in oratorical order to tell the story. So the story of the church also reinforces the story of Christ. So we're going to see Jesus brought up on trumped up charges. You know, Jesus said he's going to do this. No, he didn't say that. Right? So they're going to say, Stephen said this. No, he didn't say that. All right? But blasphemous words against Moses. Moses isn't God. 
can't blaspheme against Moses, but they took Moses pretty seriously. Blaspheming against God. What's, what is that? The early church, if you look at these early sermons, you look at Paul's letters, which were written before this. The first part of the New Testament written were some of Paul's letters. Like Galatians probably was the very first one. Galatians, Ephesians, first part of the New Testament that was written down. So you look at what Paul was preaching. Paul preaches Jesus being the fulfillment of the law. Right? Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came that the law may be fulfilled through him. Because the only way we're saved by his death is if he kept the law, the law we couldn't keep. So if that's what Stephen's preaching, well then, yeah, they're going to try, try to take that the wrong way because they don't want to acknowledge that Jesus was the Son of God. So they're saying that, they're saying Jesus did away with Moses. We don't need that anymore. Which is not what Jesus taught. And that's not what Paul preached. Right? He didn't do away with the law. The law is still there to convict us. The law is still there to do what the law does, which is kill us. To show you that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And then, oh, by the way, Jesus kept all that stuff for you perfectly. So, yeah, you can, you can repent. You can be forgiven. But you still got to keep this because what does a God-fearing life then look like? It looks like keeping the law. You can't throw it out. It's not anarchy, right? You can't just do what you want. And there were different groups at different times that tried to do that. So that was one of our Lutheran confessions. Rage against a group called the Antinomians, which that's uh, the Greek word meaning against the law. So these people said, oh, well, Jesus died for my salvation. The law doesn't matter. I can do what I want. I can do what I want because Jesus died for my sins, so I can do what I want. No, no, that's not what it means. I mean, yes, Jesus died for your sins, so yes, you're still a sinner. So yes, you can, you can confess your sins and be forgiven, but it doesn't mean you can just do what you want. And if you are living your life that way, you have to question, do I actually have the Holy Spirit? Am I really, do I really believe anything that I've been taught? If you're living your life like that, you have to question it. The problem is, if you can ask the question, right, that's how that works. If you can ask, the, if you know to ask the question, am I, do I really believe? Do I really have faith? If you can ask the question, you're okay. If, if you don't think you have to ask the question, then it might be too late already. Someone has to ask it for you and go, hey, buddy, you're kind of going down a bad path. Right? So this whole idea of the law was just abolished because of what Jesus did. And, and that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these guys are going to try to do. That's what they tried to do against Jesus. And that's what they're going to try to do against the early church. We're going to see that parallel here with Stephen. They're like, okay, say, hey, he's blaspheming against God and against Moses. We've heard him. And, well, we can't quite put our finger on it, but we're going to pay these guys even though, oh, that's a sin, but, you know, whatever. The ends justify the means. We're going to get pay these guys to trump up the charges. And so they set up false witnesses, just like they did to Jesus, right, on Monday, Thursday, and said, hey, this man never ceases, right, never ceases to speak words against this holy place and against the law. And so then they looked at him, and what do they say? Like, is Stephen bothered, right? What does it say there in verse 15? Gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So he's like not bothered. Like, okay, whatever happens is what's going to happen. Stephen is accepting of this. Now the high priest comes in. He says, hey, is, is this what they were saying about you true? And Stephen preaches the serpent, right? That's what he does. And so he gives them an entire history. It's like, oh, you're talking about doing away with Moses and the law? Well, let me tell you our story, which they all know very well. And he tells them the whole story. Abraham, you have to leave where you live. I'm going to tell you where to live. This is what's going to happen. This is what your descendants are. And oh, by the way, here's Moses. And it's like, oh yeah, you're going to die before you see this come to fruition. But he believed the promise. And you know, he gets that in. But he believed the promise. And the same thing with Moses. And oh yeah, all these guys, they're all going to die. And they're going to wander. And he tells them the whole story, which is the majority of the remainder of the chapter, right? And we saw this when we studied Hebrews, that review of the patriarchs and them believing in the promise. And this is kind of like, again, this is the same thing, the reviewing 
that whole story of salvation from the Old Testament through the patriarchs, and gets all done. And then he kind of gives it back to him. You know, it's sort of like we've just fast forwarded to the end of the chapter. Like we're all the way back to verse 51. We can go back through some of this if you want. But he then gets all done and says, hey, you guys are just like everybody else. Just like all of our ancestors have been who didn't want to listen. God talked and they didn't want to listen. They didn't like what he had to say. And you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. And as your fathers did, you're doing it right here. You know, and they said they killed all of those before the coming of the righteous one. Oh, and by the way, you betrayed and murdered him too. You received the law as delivered by the angels, but you didn't keep the law. So it's like, well, I, nobody's doing away with the law. You're not keeping the law. And that, that they were not happy with that, to say the least, right? So the ground their teeth at him. He gazed into heaven. He sees heaven open. He knows what's coming. He knows that, right, this is the end. And he is granted a vision of what is to come. And we'll come back to the end at the end. But he gets a vision. He's still not bothered. He's completely at peace, right? And then they killed him, and that's it. There's like all that sermon, and then they stoned him because they didn't like what he had to say. And that's it. And he says exactly the same words Jesus said, right? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's exactly what he says. Don't hold this sin against them. Yeah. Receive my spirit. Father, unto your hands I commit my spirit, just like Jesus said. And then don't hold this sin against them. And then he died. So he's completely not bothered throughout this whole thing. He is completely at peace. And that went through a very long chapter really, like, really fast. So what do you want to talk about with some of this? Because there's, there's little things here and there that got added in. It's not just narrative. It's, narrative, it's the narrative of the journey of God's people through the patriarchs, but then he, he adds things. And actually, he uses their entire history against them as a condemnation, which is the other brilliant thing. It's just like he's completely calm. He knows he's going to die. And he completely condemns them with every sentence he offers. He goes, like, oh, here's a patriarch, and here's what happened, and oh, you're not like that. And oh, here's something else that happened, and you're not like that either. You know, it's, it's every true story he's telling is also a condemnation of these people. Uh, Hmm? Yeah. The truth. Before, this is when they were cut to the heart, they repented. Mm -hmm. This time, in verse 54, when it says they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed their teeth at him. Mm hmm. Okay, so they were repentant. Well, when it said that they repented before, where was that? <coughs> that was back a couple chapters, right? I want to go back. I don't think it's back that far, but it was back a little bit. Find that? Can you find where they were repenting? That one. Uh, 
That is way back. I want to say it was in chapter three. telling them to repent. No, it actually says that they were, that their their heart was convicted. You know, that, that it turned okay. them toward God. Acts 3.19, see, that might be, it doesn't say anything about a heart. No, nope. okay. that was again calling them to repentance. It was actually saying that they, they had a change of heart. Day of Pentecost. I'm looking right at it. it was uh, chapter two, twenty thirty-seven. Mm-hmm. But that was, but that's the difference. And, and there is a slight difference. So thirty-seven, twenty-seven, yes, thirty-seven, thirty-seven. Yeah. So that is the day of Pentecost. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's Peter's first sermon, and that is the first converts. So different. So you have a group here that was open and receptive to the Holy Spirit and their hearts were convicted. And then you have this different language in 7 where they gnashed their teeth. So they were enraged and grounded. What has it got in a different translation? So 7 54 Cut to the heart, King James says. Now i got to look at the Greek. It's, 15, it's verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Cut to the heart, right. And they gnashed their teeth at him with their teeth. Yeah, so that cut to the heart goes two ways. So they, mm-hmm. when, when they're cut to the heart toward repentance, that's good. This kind of cut to, cut to the heart and gnashing their teeth, that's where they're just absolutely livid. They're murderous. Yeah. They've so. taken the opposite view. X, what are we, seven? Man actually uses the word enraged. Yep. So let's see. 54. 754. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, cut to the heart, Cardius. Yep. See, that's the problem with all the different interpretations. Cut yeah, because the, the words can. The fear is, isn't exactly the same. Words can be. Yeah. Yes, I am. I can be mad about something, but it doesn't necessarily cut to the core of my belief, like cut to the heart would mean. Right. You know, that's one implies, you know, you you really get, you know, you cut to my core beliefs. I know I'm wrong, but I'm mad because you pointed it out versus, well, you just made me mad, you know. Yeah, a kuo is a verb to do. That's where we get acoustic. So, yeah, so a kunotes. It's a tanta, kaneto, it's 142, that's a weird word. Yeah, so it's, hearing these things, they were cut to the quick. Hearing these things, they were cut to the, it's a, see, it's a weird construction, that's why you get those, the, that translation. It's, hearing these things, upon hearing these things, they were Cut to the quick in the heart and gnashed their teeth. Yeah, it's 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 like it's uh, 
one of those things that piles on so that they're cut to the quick in their hearts and ground their teeth. There's, it's like, like a comp, it's like a big compound phrase. Well, gnashing, gnashing their teeth is something that they do in Hades, or, or right, where, it's where they talk about, you know, people being Yeah, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, teeth, right? Yes. So, yep. So it's... And then, I think Lutheran Study Bible has a little word about grinding teeth. Page yeah. 1276. Of course you have it. What does it say? <laughs> postures and postures and gestures. That's a good. That's a good article. That's one of those things we should make. I should make copies of for you. Yeah. So gnashing, gnashing. Where's gnashing? Gape the mouth. Standing wide mouth and the throwing mat. Gnash teeth. Yeah. Bearing your teeth and gleaning is a is an expression of anger. Yeah. Well, well, okay. We knew that, that. But it could be. It could also be pain. I mean, people that are in pain or in. Um, they, they will grind their teeth. No. Oh. But I don't see these men being in pain. No. They're, they're more yeah. critical, negative. Gape them out. That's why I like, like, Luther didn't tell really long stories in his sermons, but he would make these little one liners that are awesome. And I always remember that he would say, it's like, like, you know, as, as, like a sinner before, you know, because I, I want to say it was about just being in awe of God's graciousness. And so we say, you know, that the forgiven sinner stands gaping open mouth like a, chew, a, a cow in a field chewing its gut. You're just like, all right. He said something that he does these one-liners that are always really cool. But yeah, so it, it's both cut to the quick and cut to the heart, like cut in the heart. That is a really weird phrase. And that's probably why they sometimes do one or the other. They don't say both. But yeah, upon hearing these things, they were, upon hearing this, upon hearing these things, they were infuriated and cut to the heart, cut, infuriated and cut to the quick, infuriated or cut to the quick, it could be either way. It could be infuriated or it could be cut to the, cut to the quick, but infuriated in the heart and ground their teeth. Basically, they were enraged. And gnashed their teeth. Yeah. They were yeah. very mad. Yeah, it's a weird. That's a weird. That's a weird sentence. But, but yeah, so it's got all of those thoughts. It's all right. It is all there in the original language. And I think of and again, this is me talking. This is not like some authority saying, "Oh, this commentator." In, 5,000 years, you know, 2,000 years ago said this. I think of the gnashing of the teeth and I think of the hardening of the heart. You know, that being cut to the heart. Uh, because you hear about someone's heart being opened or their heart being softened. When I hear cut to the heart enraged and cut to the heart, I think hardness of heart. So it's like they're done. That's it. They're like Pharaoh. This is it. Exactly like Pharaoh. And we've seen that. He's, they keep alluding to the Exodus a lot. So I don't think that's a wrong thought. So when you see that infuriated and cut to the heart, I immediately think there is no talking to them. They're done listening. They're, they weren't listening when he started talking. Their mind was already made up. Uh, they were not receptive to the gospel is my point. So like Saul, like we're going to see what a honey Saul is in the next couple mm -hmm. chapters. Yeah, what a turnaround that is, right? Um, God will do that. Yeah, yeah. So you have like the greatest missionary who's ever lived, who was also the worst human being on the planet at one time. But you know, so on average, he's okay I know guy. Why he did that? Yeah. Because he he took somebody that was that was evil and and um, just turned him around. That's what God so, does. It's the great yeah, reversal. He, That's he the great thing of the Bible. Of it so that we yeah. can see. You know, some people will say, well, I'm I'm too bad. You know, I've done too many bad things in my life for God to love me or right. forgive me. Right. And he, he, Paul serves as a good example of that. The Bible's full of those guys, mm -hmm. though. I mean, David was no 
Really? I mean, because we always think the patriarchs as being these stand-up guys, except when we actually read their story and go, oh yeah, he wasn't so great after all, was he? No, none of these guys are. You know, Paul, he was awful. But that's, that's God's theme, is the great reversal and the great, even the scandal of the cross. Okay, let's going to take the worst punishment men could come up with, the most humiliating, degrading, painful way to die. And guess what? I'm going to work the salvation of the world through that because I'm God. You're like, okay. Like, why does it have to be crucifixion? Because that's what he does. He takes the worst and makes it the best. You know, he takes, okay, how, how do I save the world? I got to die. I, I will die myself. God will die. Okay. Be right. Yeah. Blood has to be shed. And it's got to be holy, innocent, perfect, pure blood. Well, right here, right, right where we are, mm-hmm. you have the same contrast. But it's just uh, uh, because you have these men who are so furious, their hearts are hardened, they're gnashing their teeth. And then it says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, mm-hmm. and saw God, saw the glory of God. So you have that, that contrast right there at that moment of two absolutely opposites. Right. So you have these guys, minds made up, and Stephen just says, well, you know, there's the Son of Man, right? There's the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. Uh, and then they stopped up their ears and like, I don't want to hear anymore. So they're done. Uh, heaven's open, and they don't, even, they don't even want to look. Now, could they see what Stephen saw? No. But Do you think they could have? Possibly. Possibly. Uh, if they had looked up into heaven, could they have? Maybe they could have. Maybe they could have. I'm not going to. I don't. I think that's likely. I think that's a possibility that that's something God would do. It's, heaven is actually open. All you had to do was look up to see it. And you're so angry in your sin that you couldn't even do that. Now, it does not imply that here. No. There's no hint of that here. But that would not surprise me that that's how it happened. Because that just seems like. That's the kind of stuff that goes on with these people that just don't want to even entertain the idea that they might be wrong. Uh, and, you know, his vision did not help his case. I mean, there's, okay, like, oh, yeah, that's more blasphemy. I mean, as if they needed more evidence to kill him, that probably did not help. Uh, it also confirms the fact that you know Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Like, where does that come from? Well, this confirms that he would be at the right hand of the Father. Stephen's vision confirms it. Is it an actual vision? Is he just proclaiming it's an actual vision? He saw this. I think uh, it's not even implied that it's not an actual vision. You know, so this is Stephen is seeing heaven opened. He sees where he's about to go. Why? Because this is for us, and that's the thing we haven't talked about yet. Uh, but they grabbed him, they laid their hands on him, they killed him. Stephen knows where he's going. He's still not bothered. He's absolutely not bothered now. It's like, hey, there's Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father where you're getting ready to send me. That's where I'm going. That's where you could go to if you open your hearts. He didn't say that. It's all implied. But he, And that is there to comfort us because no matter how bad the persecution is going to get, which it's going to get, and we as Americans don't appreciate this like the Christians in other countries do, who have been persecuted, which hasn't even come over this side of the ocean yet, but it's coming. Uh, we've seen it in older times. We know the persecution the church goes on, but it's going on today. It's going on in Eastern Africa. Uh, you know, there's Coptic Christians getting killed every day. There's Catholic, or there is uh, Canadian pastors being arrested regularly now for preaching when they're not allowed to have church because of viruses, even now, okay? This is like a couple weeks ago, not a year ago. Uh, There's nonsense going on, all right? So the persecution is coming, and hearing the stories of the martyrs is to let you know that's okay, right? And they've been doing that since the beginning of the book of Acts has been preparing us for this moment here. Because what happens when Stephen, Stephen, when Peter and John and the other guys are put in jail? What happened when they got out? They went back to 
preached. Okay. And, and they preached. And what else did they say? They rejoiced because they suffered for the gospel. Because Jesus told them, you're going to suffer for the gospel. And by the way, all of you but one of you is going to die. He basically told them that they were going to die for this. This is what your life is going to look like. And they rejoiced because this is awesome. This is what Jesus said was going to happen. We're spreading God's word and they don't want us to. And they rejoiced in that. That's what we're supposed to do too, which is completely the opposite of how you think we should be. It's like, I don't want to be persecuted for this. I don't want people, I don't, no one wants that, but it's going to happen. And they're supposed to take comfort in the fact that that's what's waiting for us. Jesus standing at the right hand of God going, yeah, come on. I have prepared a place. It's all good. This is temporary, 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 which is what Jesus' whole message was. Your life is going to be hard. If you're a Christian, your life is going to be even harder. But that's okay because blink of an eye and all that. Eternity, a whole lot different. A whole lot longer. And so they rejoiced that they're suffering for the gospel. Now here's the first one of them that got killed for the gospel. And he's okay with it the whole entire time. He's trying to convert the people that are persecuting him. Right? That's amazing. How many pastors today are going to do that when, when they get, okay, it's like, okay, you're going to, I mean, they're not maybe going to back us up against the wall and shoot us yet, but they might try to put us away for not closing churches and all that other stupidity. Yeah, it's like, oh yeah, you can't do this. Right now, how many people are going to stand there and go, yeah, you can't do this, but you know, that's okay that you're doing this, but let me tell you about Jesus anyway. And how many are just like, I'm going to just behave so I don't get in trouble. You're not going to know until you get put in that situation. Any of us. It's like, okay, you're not going to be, know what you're going to do until they put the gun to your head, basically. Uh, so it's a hard question to actually answer. We know how we want to be. And that's all we're going to say about that. But these guys are rejoicing at the persecution, and Stephen is like ecstatic. He sees heaven, he sees Jesus, he knows where he's going, and guess what? He's still working. He's still preaching to these guys. Hey, you're being stubborn, you're being dumb. Listen to this. But I didn't want to. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ears. I always like that phrase, uncircumcised of heart. Right? Because that goes right to that cut to the heart. Right? Cutting being the obvious snip-snip. Right? Because what do you need for a covenant? Blood has to be shed. So the covenant of circumcision is this blood must be shed and that is a sign to you that you are my people because you look different from every other people on the planet now because nobody else does this. So circumcised of heart, so that's what, what do you have to do to, to be a part of that covenant? Like how did, What is circumcised of heart? What does that actually mean then? So, and it's talking about resisting, right? So if you're circumcised of heart, your heart is softened again. It's, it's, it's receptive to the gospel. You're, if your heart is broken, it's receptive. You know, and that's what the law does. It break. Once you're convicted by the law, then you are able to receive the gospel. If you don't think you're a sinner... I can tell you all about Jesus all you want. If you don't think you're, you're a sinner, it doesn't do you any good. Like, great, so you're telling me about Jesus. I'm not a sinner. If you don't understand that, the gospel doesn't do any good. So that, that's being circumcised or hard, being tenderized like a steak. You know, then you can accept, you can accept the fact that he died for you. Um, God doesn't force conversion. Right, so he doesn't make you. Just like he didn't force Pharaoh to not let his people go, like God hardened his heart. You know, we always think, well, God hardened his heart. That's why he didn't let his people go. He didn't want to let his people go anyway. So God said, "Fine, you don't want to let my people go. Be that way. Harden your heart." Yeah, he could still change his mind, but he didn't. Same thing as he's not going to pound his Holy Spirit into you. He's like, I'm going to pound the Holy Spirit into you until you listen. He doesn't do that. 
It's like you, the Holy Spirit goes out and either you got to be careful we don't say we decide because we don't decide, but it goes in your ears and we're receptive. We don't resist it or we do. But he doesn't pound it into us. Now you can resist it. And he's like, I don't want to listen to this. Just like these people, I don't want to listen to what you're saying, Stephen, okay? I don't want to hear it. If you're a blasphemer, we're going to kill you. Or, oh, hey, you know, it kind of makes sense because, yeah, we're, we're breaking the law. We're not listening. And that's the guys on Pentecost, those Jews who first heard and went, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. I understand. He was a Messiah. This makes sense. And you got these guys that are just like, no, I'm right. You're wrong. You need to die. Okay, so being receptive is not resisting the Holy Spirit, which is the only thing we actually have a choice in. God chooses you. You choose to ignore him or reject him. That's the choice we have. We don't choose to accept him. We don't ask him into our heart. But we can say, I don't want anything to do with you. Yeah, I've heard about you, but I don't want anything to do with you. Which many do. Many, many, many do, unfortunately. Right, well, that was a, turned into a rant uh, a little bit, <laughs> but. Well, I guess it was a good rant. But that, that, that pattern, you know, not only do we see the pattern of Christ's life and suffering repeated here, but then we see this theme that begins with rejoicing in persecution and then the first martyr going to his death basically with a smile on his face and still trying to convert people. And now we're going to see, well, someone who's just awful. You know, So next week we're going to pick up with Saul and uh, he's just awful. And we're going to see some magicians. We're going to see a necromancer. I think he's a necromancer if I remember correctly. Maybe not. We're going to see some cool miracles. I mean, there's there's a lot going on just in chapter 8. There's like two great, three great stories. Two Philip stories and then a story about Simon the Magician in chapter 8 and then 9 we get into uh, Paul's conversion. And then we get into Peter being kind of dumb, which is always good. So we got Peter being dumb and then Peter being coming enlightened. Uh, because he learned, the one thing that got to hand it to Peter, he might be dumb, do dumb things sometimes, he might be hard-headed, but when he learns his lesson, he takes it to heart. And he's like, oh, I get it now, I understand. Um, so, I guess this is about the last time we see Peter being boneheaded in chapter 10. Peter's a vision, is it? No, we're going to see Peter and Paul get into it then, but then... That's the last time and we see Peter. Circumcision. Yeah, and yeah. We get into it about. And that's basically the only thing we see Peter being a bonehead about in Acts is because he wants to cling to, and we get it. If you're raised in that society as a Jew, and you've been raised to observe all this ceremonial stuff, to all of a sudden to be told, you don't got to do that anymore. Oh. Even though Jesus told them, you don't have to do this anymore. And then they're just like, yeah, but I want to do that because I'm comfortable. Right. What I do. And everybody should yeah. 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 And you should want, you know. I mean, and then also, if you think about it, and it's getting ahead, but you know, if you think about it, if you're raised in that culture, all of a sudden, if somebody puts a plate of oysters and shrimp in front of you, you're going to be repulsed by that. You're not going to go, well, I've always wanted to eat it because it's good. They don't know that. They know it's like, I'm not, that's revolting. That's not food. Get that away. That's not, that's poison. Get that away. It's unclean. You know, so that's got to be a heck of a culture shock. So that dream probably shook things up a little bit. That's a good dream. It's a good dream. And it's a good lesson, that vision that he was granted. That was an important lesson for his further missionary work. That was going to be a stumbling block. So good lessons, good doctrinal lessons to learn in that chapter, but chapter 8 has got neat stories in it too. So that's where we'll continue next week. Questions, comments, anything that we did tonight? So again, I do, I'm do. i doing this book loosey-goosey. I'm not doing a whole lot of 
you know, this is what the commentaries say and getting in deep into the language and all that because it's mostly narrative. It's mostly stories. So we're just going to read the stories and we're going to talk about them. Uh, when it talks about doctrine, we'll talk about the doctrine. But a lot of this, we're, it's just narrative and what it tells us about the early church.